exactly where the deputy mayor was going to sit and I decided that if he had a choice between being Jim Skelly and Dirty Jensen, it was a better idea to be Joe. So. <laughs> and if that doesn't, as uh, Jody correctly pointed out, if that doesn't confuse one in respect to the characterization of identity, <laughs> a significant part of what we're going to try and grapple with briefly this evening, that nothing should. I have a lot of slides here, and I'm going to self-evidently leave all the slides with you. I'm not going to go into the European slides deliberately at the beginning of the speech. Firstly, because we'll talk about them in the discussion following it, and in order to dig more deeply into it, you can look into the slides themselves. In those slides, I have the structural issues associated with Europe, its evolution, its current structures, the pressures being experienced as a consequence of Brexit, and certain challenges to the maintenance of the dream, the vision, the construct of European unity at the level of 28 or 27 or whatever number it may eventually turn out to be. But I'd like to leave that for the discussion, so I'm inviting Jody and Dan and Jim uh, and Barry to jump into that discussion, which I'm very enthusiastic about. But the reason that I want to set it back in our discussion today is I think there are structural elements that account for the stresses that are being experienced in Europe today. And I think if one looks at Europe without looking at those structural elements, then one can get confused about what is happening. I'd argue, by the way, in respect of the Middle East, for example, of the area between the southern Mediterranean and Central Asia, which is another way of looking at that particular space, I would argue that the same structural elements are driving fragmentation in those areas as well. I would argue that the same structural elements are causing challenges in the ASEAN region in Southeast Asia, and certainly setting back development in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'd also argue that some of the waves of populism and orthodoxy that we've seen competing for position in Latin America are driven by some of the same considerations. So I'm going to offer you the framing considerations in terms of what I say at the beginning, and then one can unpack them in the European context, or if you choose any other context that you're more familiar with as we go forward. So, let's see if this is working. Is it? Was. Well, can you? Who's got the expertise? She's the magician. <laughs> it's very important to have magicians in the audience. There we go. Well done. Yeah? Thank you. This has been. Mm -hmm. Oh, battery power. Anyhow, I can do it from here. Don't worry, it's not a crisis. Maybe no, we should start right. the game because the problem is... It's yeah, dead now. Right. Can, can you start from now? Yeah. Okay. All right. The logic of this whole discussion is that we are at an inflection point in history. We've reached, I'd argue, an end of an interesting era, and we are starting to experience a shift in the tectonic plates of geoeconomics and geopolitics that are causing a series of things to happen whose trajectories are currently uncertain. The impact of that on Europe is very considerable, but it's not the only part of the world affected by it, and many of those underlying forces are not European in origin. So, connectivity is perhaps the defining feature of the present landscape. The origins of globalization, I'm happy to talk about more generally, but I'm not going to spend time on them now. That's a picture from last year, from IATA, in terms of the level of flight connectivity. That's a reasonable capture of an average day in respect of connectivity on the internet. The level of engagement that Dan can talk highly specifically to the perverse consequences of this is wholly unprecedented. 
And it's not over. The Chinese are planning currently the largest infrastructural project in history by at least one and maybe one and a half orders of magnitude in terms of the Belt and Road Commission. A wholly extraordinary level of connectivity extending over an entire region. Canals, rivers, oil pipelines, gas pipelines, railroads, highways, and maritime transport. That, if it is executed, will have both negative and positive consequences of almost entirely unforeseeable scale and scope over the course of the next 20 or 30 years. <clears throat> now, if you think about it, if you take the proposition, and that's certainly the proposition that I would advance, that the purpose of human engagement with natural phenomena in the context of the biosphere is an attempt to improve well-being. We're a reason for us to do anything if it doesn't produce a better condition at the end. And if you think about it from that particular perspective, then there are probably five things that we need to be able to get our heads around. The first thing that we have to try and do is to make economic growth socially and environmentally sustainable. If it's not socially sustainable, if it's not inclusive, if it doesn't contribute directly to social welfare, there's not all that much point in driving it. If it causes the destruction of the biosphere, if it is environmentally destructive, we won't get away with it for very long. The second thing in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals and everything that we were able to achieve, at least marginally in the context of the Millennium Development Goals, is associated with addressing the scope of extreme poverty and dealing with rising inequality. So we need a lens through which to think about our efforts to eradicate poverty and manage the challenge of inequality. And that lens, I'm suggesting, should be equity. Thirdly, if you apply the same logic across this thinking, security, whether it is at the human level, at the national level, the regional level, or the global level, is really all about reducing human vulnerability at different scales. And therefore, ring-fencing particular expenditures, national security, in a particular way, and according budget priority to that, is probably not really the best way of thinking about it. So the third challenge, then, is reconceptualizing security at multiple scales in the context of efforts to reduce vulnerability. Now, those are the three primary things that one needs to be able to get to grips with if you're going to make the world a better place if you're going to improve human well-being in the aggregate. But then you've got to start thinking about what you need in order to be able to do that. And there are two things that you need. You have to reach agreement on the quantum of norms, rules of the game, formal and informal. When they're formal, we call them laws. When they're informal, we speak of social norms but the quantum of norms that are necessary to allow nearly 7.6 billion people to coexist on one planet. If you have different rules of the game, if some of you in this group today think it's perfectly all right to throw rocks at me, and others are appalled by the idea that you're throwing rocks at me and try and beat you on the head with sticks, it's not going to be a great lecture. So everything in life at the end of the debate depends on agreement on the rules of the game in the context in which you find yourself. But in a world that is as highly connected as I've suggested, in which no value system and no normative system enjoys primacy today, we have to respect cultural diversity and we have to work continuously to try to inform that process of norm setting with insights out of different cultural contexts. And then, and only then, when we've worked our way through those issues,
can we plausibly design systems of collective action at transnational scales, which you can think of at the largest level as being global governments. But coming back to Europe for a moment, recognize that the challenge of Europe is really about those two things. It's about what norms define Europe, what values these norms are premised on, and what institutions of governance at the interface between the national and the regional are appropriate to dealing with the cultural diversity, the need for normative coherence, the sense of identity at multiple levels. And if I were to do ASEAN, it would be no different. If I were to do the GCC in the Gulf, it would be no different. If I were to do the Levant, it would be no different. So that's the challenge. That's the context. And the great difficulty about it is that we're at a point at which, because of this level of connectivity that we've engendered, the complexity that we face in dealing with these issues at the scales we have to address them exceed our rather limited mental capacity. So, let's ask what we mean when we talk about complex systems. And this is a gross oversimplification, but it actually contains all of the core elements. Complex systems have many strongly in interdependent variables. There are multiple inputs contributing to any observed output. And as a consequence, determining causality in linear terms is impossible. A doesn't cause B. A may play a role in causation, but there are many other elements in the complex system that lead to that particular outcome. And the assumption of monocausality leads to very bad policy. Secondly, there are feedback loops in all complex systems. A causes C to do something which causes G to do something which feeds into E, which feeds back into B. Thirdly, there's a propensity on the parameters or around the parameters of complex systems for chaotic behavior to emerge, simply because of the level of connectivity and the number of multiple independent variables. As a result of that, we have multiple metastatal states. A system can settle in a particular condition for a certain point, and then, when an inflection point is crossed, shift quite significantly in another direction. And the distribution of outputs out of complex systems is completely non-Gaussian in character. There's no bell. Now let's think about it for two seconds. Anyone here who has children knows perfectly well they can't control their children. Anyone here who is not yet in the position of having children knows perfectly well that their parents have tried many times to control them and haven't been very successful. Anyone who has taught a class knows that you cannot determine what students are going to do in a class. And anyone who has worked in a faculty knows perfectly well that it's absolutely impossible to reach agreement for a, on a sustainable basis within a university faculty. I'm just taking trivial little examples to indicate that everything we live in and are part of is self-evidently a complex system. Humanity and the way in which it functions is self-evidently a complex system. The way in which humans work at scale has all of these actors. But we're remarkably simplistic in the way we tackle these particular problems. Economics for a long period of time was premised on rational actor thesis. The idea that equilibrium was continuously sought, that individuals were always pursuing their rational self-interest, and that you could therefore model with extremely rudimentary econometric models the likely behavior and forecast particular outcomes. Of course, that's nonsense. 
it's, it, it's not a question that the discipline isn't worth doing. The discipline is worth doing. But it's just complete nonsense, isn't that nonsense? That's not how humans work when interacting with one another. Now, if that's the case, then one has to recognize that we live in a biosphere and that we, as humanity, as the human system, are interacting with a series of organic biological systems around us in a process of continuous coevolution. We have the ability to cause great disturbance in those organic biological systems, in systems of climate, in respect of ocean patterns. And they, those systems, as a result of these interfaces, by definition have the ability to cause extraordinary impacts on the way in which human societies function. Think of drought, think of flood, Think of a whole variety of forces causing forced migration on large scales. So that's the world in which we try to make policy. And that's why we're not very good. So how do we do this? Let's be realistic about a couple of elements in the present day. Interconnectivity exponentially increases uncertainty. The more elements are connected in a system, the higher the degree of unpredictability in respect of outcomes. Broadly speaking, this is not perfectly precise, but an arithmetic increase in the elements in the system leads to a geometric increase in the number of potential links and an exponential increase in the number of potential patterns, and the algebra is quite simple. So broadly speaking, if you start out with four elements in the system, you have six links and 64 patterns. Ten elements in the system will give you 45 links and 35 billion patterns. Just by only ten, we did nothing. So how do we survive? We survive by mapping and assuming it. We operate on the basis of what we call cognitive heuristics. When you walk into a room laid out like this with a projector up there and some lights and a desk and some chairs, you say, oh, I know what this is. This is a lecture. I've been here before. I know, how, I know what to do in this circumstance. I don't have to run around and find out who's who and why they're sitting in that chair and what this thing over here is. I have a familiar map of this particular experience. If I'm crossing a street, I'm applying a map. I see there's traffic, I see there are pedestrian areas, I see there are bars, I see there may be traffic lights, and I immediately orient myself in a sensible way. I don't look at the 18,946 variables present in that particular location. I don't do any computational mathematics in terms of their interactions. I just cross the street. And that works until it doesn't work. If there's a chap with a sniper's rifle on the third story of the building on the right-hand side of the street, I may end up lying in a pool of blood. Because that wasn't part of my heuristic in respect to feeling. But amazing. That phenomenon, too, as those of you who are familiar with conditions of conflict and crisis know only too well, that phenomenon, too, gets incorporated into a heuristic. And people survive through civil wars, large scale destabilization, and the interaction of forces trying to kill one another in ordinary domestic. So we survive by simplifying. And it's a good survival mechanism. We've done pretty well. We've been around for a long time. We're likely to continue being around for quite some time. But it's not a good way of running policy. So let's have a look. What, what do we know? What do we know about the challenges we face today? Last year, there were about 7.5 billion people. 
UN population projection estimates suggest that the median curve, the high curve is way above it, the low curve is a bit below it, but the median curve is about 9.3 billion for 2050. We're urbanizing at an extraordinary rate. Concentration in urban centers is increasing radically, 54%. Again, 2017 up to about 67% by 2050. And if you put that in real terms, that means 2.5 billion more people in urban areas by 2050, 90% of whom will be in Africa. That's where the growth is occurring, because that's where the demographic growth is occurring. Now just think about this. Do you know that before 1934, there were never 2.5 billion people on the planet? We crossed the 2 billion mark in 1928. We're going to accommodate in urban areas in Asia and Africa more people between now and 2050 than existed before 1934. Have we any sense of the planning problem associated with it? It is enormous. Those of you who come from parts of the world associated with those areas know very well that the civil planning capability, the urban infrastructure planning capability, is going to be highly significantly challenged as a result of that particular requirement. We're aging in a wholly remarkable fashion. If you take 60 as sort of a cut-off point after which people became less economically active. 11.7% of roughly 7.2 billion in 2013 gave you 842.4 million. If you push it out to 2050, that's going to rise to nearly 2 billion because it's going to be around about 21% of the 9.3 billion. So for the first time in history, we're going to have four generations of potentially economically active people competing for an uncertain quantum of income generating employment opportunity. Think of it from a planning perspective. Think of it from the perspective of somebody who has to try and develop social policy, educational policy, labor policy, policy around urbanization, policy around urban design, policy around the political realm. And then lastly, we are facing today the largest pipeline of transformative technological change in terms of information technology, biotechnology, nanotechnology, neuro and cognitive technology that the world has ever seen by at least two orders of magnitude. Just take the number of postdocs and the number of PhD students in universities undertaking research today in order to get some sort of sense of what the pipeline looks like relative to any other period in humans. So, you're going to have an incredible life, those of you who are under 40, because everything is going to change. Those of us who are older than 40, and some of us older than that, but those of us who are older than 40 are going to see extraordinary changes in the next couple of decades. But this is going to be the world you live in, create, and have to manage in fairly extraordinary ways. So what can we conclude from that? I think the things that are driving change at the moment are firstly the secular shift in the economic center of gravity from the Atlantic, where it's been since about the middle of the 19th century, further across the Atlantic, where it moved in the 20th century as a result of the rise of the United States, to the Indo-Pacific. And that's a secular trend. It's very unlikely. It's not impossible that it will be disrupted, but it's very unlikely. It's a function of demography. It's a function of technology dissemination. It's a function of concentrated focus in both policy and investment 
on the creation of new industrial and technological opportunities. And all of those factors are coming together in growth rates. Take China and India just as two poles in respect of that, well above two X, that of the United States. So that trend is likely to continue, and it's going to have major transformative implications. The second trend has nothing to do with it, but it is also a secular trend over the last 30 years. We have seen a fundamental shift in the way in which rent was distributed as between capital and labor in the process of production over the last three decades. It starts largely with Maggie Thatcher and Ronnie Reagan. It's not terribly important. You don't have to personalize it. There were a series of drivers that created it in the first instance. But it has been fairly constant as a consequence of macroeconomic and social policy. Since then, labor gets a lower cut. Capital gets a higher cut. And there is nothing to suggest that trend is going to shift in the short term. Indeed, those congruent technologies, infotech, biotech, nanotech, neuro and cognotech that I was talking about earlier, are likely to exacerbate that very significantly. So ownership of intellectual property, the ability to monopolize, the ability to deploy capital behind innovation are going to become highly significant means of concentrated wealth in a way that bears no relationship to anything that labor is going to be able to compete with in any fashion whatever. What's happening as a result? A shift increasingly towards capital intensivity. A shift increasingly toward automation a rise in not quite unemployment, but well-paid employment opportunities, with more and more people shifting out of relatively highly paid industrial occupations into lower paid social <coughs> delivery employment opportunities. This is occurring in all of the industrial countries. It's one of the driving features of populism. So those factors, the higher returns to capital, falling returns to labor, exacerbated by the, the disruptive congruent technologies, driving jobless growth and social dislocation, are putting democracy under extraordinary levels of pressure. It's not just democracy, let me add, but representative democracy as an instrumental means of managing social and economic forces for the putative good of society became the established thesis over the last 50 years or so. And it's under challenge on every single level right now, not least in Europe, but by no stretch of the imagination exclusively so. From the United States to Southeast Asia, even to East Asia, any form of representative government is under significant stress. Now, all of those factors, but notably the shift from west to east in respect of geoeconomic trends, are causing geopolitics to raise its head. Recognize that the security architecture of the post Second World War world was defined by the United States on the basis of George Kennan's long term. The thesis behind the whole was the containment of stuff. As a consequence of that, we have NATO, Cento, Seattle, and Anzu, extending across a landscape to bring stability to the world with the objective of a particular model of social order defined largely in Washington with the support of one or two actors in Europe becoming the dominant form. Well, the world doesn't look like that anymore. There are holes in this architecture all over the place. There are holes between the Mediterranean and Central Asia. There are holes in East Asia, 
where the United States' capacity for power projection is going to be challenged highly significantly as a result of China's rise. Where what Mr. Trump has just done with Pyongyang is going to cause all sorts of extraordinary questions to arise in the minds of the Republic of Korea and Japan. And where China's rise in a neighborhood where Japan is the only non-nuclear state and where it is no longer the second largest economy in the world is causing considerable tension and reconsideration of what Japan's security role ought to be in regional terms. So, oh, and I left out the most important one in a certain sense. Mr. Putin seeking to restore power and capacity in the Russian Federation is quite explicit about three objectives. He wants to maintain nuclear parity with the United States. He wants to be taken seriously as a great power on all issues of significant concern to Russia. And he wants, rather like the United States did for a long period of time, to control the near war. It's the Monroe Doctrine seen from Moscow. All of those factors change the geopolitical landscape. And that, self-evidently, in part is driving forced migration and putting further stress on representative democracy in several of the advanced economies. And that, the forced migration, is obviously also driven by social dislocation and reduced opportunities for economic activity in parts of the world which are losing out in the context of economic growth. Now, all of that would be quite enough to keep us awake at night if we had to think about it on a continuing basis. But it's complicated by the fact that the human footprint of nearly 7.6 billion is significantly disturbing the biosphere in multiple ways, on which several of us can tell you certain things and Dan will scare the living daylights out of you if he decides that he wants to go off on his track in that particular regard, perfectly justifiably. The point that I'm really getting at is that there are too many of us in what is effectively a finite adaptive system, and that as we urbanize, travel, commute, produce, consume, and waste at increasing scale, we are causing a disruption in the biosphere on a scale that we haven't had any experience on in the past. So that's the challenge. These are the tectonic plates. They're shifting. What direction they will take is a function of scenarios and foresight. What impact they have in any particular geographical location is a function of the underlying structural challenges in that location. But none of these are likely not to shape the world over the next decade. And their interactions are going to pose fairly extraordinary challenges. Now, there's the stuff along the bottom of that, I'm not going to do it now, but if you want to have a look at it, I'm happy to share the material. All that stuff along the bottom there are scenarios based on interactions between these particular elements developed for different organizations, ranging from the National Intelligence Council through IATA, looking at smaller subsets in the context of geopolitical scenarios, looking at the implications in Europe for Brexit, etc., etc. The only point that I'm really making to you is there's no answers here, because you're dealing with a complex system. You're dealing with a set of interactions that can play out in a whole variety of ways, but that's the frame within which it's helpful to think. Now, there are two other elements here. There's are the migratory flows. Here's the jobless growth. Those two reinforce one another. Those three reinforce one another. Those two reinforce one another. And that, those two play into one another as well. So when you change the intensity of these interactions, you can then draw different conclusions about likely scenarios as you play through these spaces. This is just a snapshot. 
but I want to show you something that gives a little bit of evidence of how this has played out over the course of the past several years. This is the World Economic Forum does a global risk network analysis every year at the end of the year. It's a fairly simple analysis. There's about 300 of us who worry about these types of things and write a little bit about them. And everyone is polled on a continuing basis about the issues that you see rising, the issues that you see declining, the directional <coughs> impact that you see. It's, it's not a very sophisticated analysis, but it's, it's something to work with. It's a sort of an example of collective intelligence among a pre-selected group. For a considerable period of time, global governance failure started around about 2010 and went through 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, still at the center of the whole nexus, out to 2014, when something snuck into that, which was at the time called political and social inability. Uh, instability. If you had a look at it by 2015, global governance was no longer at the center of this particular problem. This profound social instability, as it was redefined at that point, had now played out into the failure of national governance and state collapse and crisis related to unemployment and underemployment with interstate conflict starting to, start to rear its head. Just think about those issues that we were looking at earlier. Can you see the way they were playing out as we went through this exercise? If you look at 2017, large-scale involuntary migration, the failure of national governance is still sitting at the center, the failure of regional or global governance, profound social instability, unemployment or underemployment, and a little bit of fiscal crisis because the system is not working. You take it forward out to 2018, you now have failure of regional or uh, global governance, unemployment, profound social instability, state collapse or crisis, large-scale involuntary migration, adverse consequences of technological advances, all coming into play. The, the, the point I'm trying to make is not the detail. The point I'm trying to make is understand there's never one thing happening. It's always systemic. It's always a series of issues interacting with one another in a variety of different ways that one has to try to get a grip on and one try, has to try from the perspective of policy to be able to think about in sensible ways. That's the challenge of policy. We're making a mistake in this space, and I'm going to stop here. From roughly the end of the 18th century, we shifted the leitmotif of governance. Up to that point in time, there were variations on the divine right of kings, or on an understanding of the estates, nobility, clergy, and common there were normative frameworks within which society was ordered based on particular premises about how society was supposed to work 18th century stuff started happening and i'm not going to run from voltaire through rousseau and montesquieu all the way up to hume uh, and, uh, and bentham but broadly speaking we get this proposition that the people are sovereign. As the Declaration of Independence in the United States says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and believe me, men, men, and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that governments are instituted among men for the purpose of securing the exercise of these rights. And that when a government does not so secure the exercise of those rights, the people may rise up against it and replace it to the government, better calculated to secure their enjoyment. That changed everything. But today, we're not doing that. Today, it's perfectly obvious that the great majority of populations no longer trust their government no longer believe that their governments are capable of securing their welfare in any meaningful fashion. 
And governments, in order to be able to deal with this complexity, are increasingly starting to use electronic, digital, and algorithmically driven mechanisms, both for surveillance and for the purpose of determining what goods should be delivered in what system, in what way. So that thing that we used to call the social contract, as between the citizen and the government, for which the government was supposed to be held accountable, is coming under a tremendous amount of stress. And we have to go into the region for that. Now, there's a ton more here, but I think we've put enough on the table to allow us to get into a sensible discussion with uh, my fellow panelists and uh, give you an opportunity of challenging, interacting, and pushing back in different ways. And the rest of the material is yet to be played with.